profoundly important are the questions that today's panelists will, are talking about and that throughout the whole conference that uh, a large part of economic growth of the last 120 years has been in large part driven by adapting to the, the, the plentiful and inexpensive petroleum and how will that change in the future. Uh, geopolitics has depended on, uh, certainly in, in world wars, on, on command of, of petroleum resources and, uh, and the expertise of our panelists in, in, in helping us to understand these profoundly important questions of, of world, uh, secu securing the world oil supply is, uh, is something we're grateful to have you here. Uh, uh, first, first speaker will be David Goldman, who, uh, Goldwyn, uh, who has, uh, has been sec Assistant Secretary of, of, of Energy for International Affairs and is now President of the Goldwyn International Securities. Uh, uh, Scott Noman, uh, who uh, works with energy and, and, and the economics of corp and corporate planning for Exxon. And uh, our, our third speaker will be Michael Clare, who is Five College Professor of uh, of Peace and World Security Studies at, at, um, in Massachusetts. Uh, I think the goal is about 20 minutes per talk, and then uh, leave us about half an hour for, uh, for, 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 uh, for questions afterwards. We'll prop, we're running about 15 minutes late, and we'll adjust the whole schedule accordingly. Please, uh, David Goldman. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here at this, uh, this prestigious university. My wife uh, did her graduate work at the University of Chicago. I'm very familiar with the critical thinking that's trained here. Um, and uh, and uh, she told me to, to be prepared, so uh, hopefully I'll, I'll do things justice. Um, thanks to, to Jeff Crane and Chris Milroy for putting this together. It's, uh, it's a terrific panel, and thank, thanks to all of you for spending your Friday evening uh, to talk about this important issue. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is an important issue. Um, in my view, um, the United States is more energy insecure than at any time since 1973. And um, that's not so much that it's an economic problem. I think actually gas prices are cheap and they could be higher. Um, it's an environmental problem, but it's an environmental problem that affects more than, than just gasoline. But our dependency on oil, the dependency of our partners, our allies, our friends, and our adversaries and competitors, um, I think is a grave, urgent, and growing threat to national security. And the third point that I want to make to you today is that I think we have the tools, and I'll talk about my top ten list of, of how we should address this problem. We have the tools and we have the money to address this issue and to change it, but what we lack is the courage. We lack the political will. And I think um, people always say in Washington, the right solution is always politically impossible. But nothing is politically impossible if you educate people and you try and lead them, or at least I, I have to think that, otherwise I couldn't do this. Um, next slide, please. What do I mean by energy security? Energy security for every country in the world is access to the resources that they need for national power. China is energy insecure because it needs, the energy, it needs oil and gas and coal to power its economy. Not only does it need to know that it can get as much as it needs, but it needs to know if it has a falling out with the United States over Taiwan or something else, that it can still get that. That's what drives its energy insecurity. It's the ability to pursue your foreign policy without coercion. Uh, or without having to, to, to sacrifice your interests to satisfy your suppliers. If you live in Georgia and Ukraine, you worry about Russia next door. You pick the wrong presidential candidate, the gas goes off in the middle of the winter. That's coercion. If you're the United States and you don't want to irritate Saudi Arabia because you don't want to stay, you don't want prices to go through the roof and get voted out of power, then you're sacrificing your foreign policy to your energy dependency. And the third thing that energy security is about is avoiding economic injury, not having volatile prices that will cause dislocations in your economy, an environmental industry, which is a nice way of saying we don't want to choke on the emissions from what we consume. So all countries, in a sense, are energy insecure. And I want to talk about why we are more energy insecure by these benchmarks than we have been in a long time. Next slide, please. Um, I'll show you some pictures, but these are essentially the points that I want to make. We are insecure because the energy market is fragile, and, and Al Hegberg talked about this earlier. It's not fragile in that we don't have enough oil in the market. It's fragile in that in that supply can't really meet demand because demand is growing exponentially here in the United States. High prices haven't tamped demand. In China and in India, places where they're first getting lights and mobility, they're going to have huge demand. Subsidies in the developing world help encourage demand. But supply is constrained by OPEC, by closed access, by politics, by lots of reasons. So the potential for dislocation is huge. 
and the reserve capacity, the ability to deal with a dislocation, is not what it used to be, and that's what makes the market fragile. Uh, next slide, please. On the demand point, uh, this slide shows what um, demand for all energy is. It comes from the IEA in 2000 and in 2030. And without, without worrying with the numbers, just to talk about oil, the world consumes about 82 million barrels of oil a day. Stop and think about that number. 82 million barrels of oil a day. The United States produces eight. Saudi Arabia produces eight. It's a huge amount. By 2030, even with growth in renewables, even if we start on a new path now to try and have different kinds of cars, different kinds of fuels, biofuels, whatever it is, we're probably going to consume twice that volume or a little less than twice that volume, 150 million barrels a day. Where is that oil going to come from? Who's going to produce it? And who's going to get rich off producing it, particularly in the countries? So the law of large numbers, it's a huge problem to change. It's a lot of money to deal with on the receiving side and on the investment side. And so that's one problem. Next slide. Back one. The other problem is that supply can't meet demand. And this is a pie chart which shows we're about access to world proven oil reserves by the end of 2005. And as Al Hegberg said, the problem is not that we don't have enough oil in the world. There's plenty of reserves. The problem is access, which is if you're going to meet demand without the price going to $100, Somebody has to produce it. Now, frankly, it doesn't matter whether a national oil company produces it or an international oil company produces it, as far as the market's concerned, as long as somebody produces it. But the fact is that national oil companies, which consume, which control about 37% of the world's resources exclusively, often don't do it. Why? Because they need money for things other than investing in oil. So Mexico doesn't have enough money to produce the oil that it needs. It might become an importer, but it can't access it because it needs it for other things. Saudi Aramco does a pretty good job of it, but other national oil companies don't. Iraq, plenty of oil. Good luck producing it there. Production sharing means, you know, companies can get access to it, but the government's going to take a big share of that. And then national oil companies, which dominate um, the control of the sector, but where there's limited access by, um, by oil companies, like in Iran, where if you want to get a 10% fee for producing it but not own any oil, you can do it, um, control that. So the answer is that, that only the concession, 30%, only about 30% of the world's oil supplies are really available for capital to come and invest and produce more oil if the market demands it. So you've got a, a market that's got a market problem. Next slide, please. The other problem is what happens if something goes bump in the night, and something always does. The problems in the world today you know, are not countries getting together to have an embargo. You lose oil supply in the market when there's a revolution in Venezuela. There goes a couple million barrels. Or there's a strike in Nigeria. There goes 500,000 barrels. Or there's a revolution in Iran. There goes 2 million barrels. And so where do you get the oil to bring on to the market? And world spare oil capacity, which is what, what either companies or countries can bring onto the market in 90 days, used to be really high, four or five million barrels a day when the prices were low, kept in, kept in the ground. Now spare oil production capacity is about two million barrels a day. 82 million barrels a day is what we consume. You lose in Iran, you lose in Nigeria, you lose somebody else, the price goes up right away because the ability to, for the market to replace it is slim. Now, why do we care about that? For national security reasons, you care about it because every minor producer in the world gets to be on the front pages of the Financial Times when they decide they don't want to produce oil or they want to throw a company out or they've got a revolution. Ecuador is on the front pages of the Financial Times. You know, Ecuador produces 250,000 barrels a day, exports that much or something like that. It's minor, but it gives them power because you can impact the market by what you produce. And that's a problem. Um, next slide, please. The other problem that we have is that the future looks an awful lot like the past, uh, except for uh, when you look at where the demand is coming from in the world, it used to come from the developed countries. We consume it for all of our, our cars and things. But the developing world is going to have the lion's share of the demand and the growth in demand because developed countries are pretty efficient or getting better at being efficient in consuming their energy. But demand is going to grow in the developing world. Again, what's the national security problem here? Who's got power? The producers. Who is dependent? the growing economies. Trying to form a political coalition, you got to worry about who's dependent on who. Next slide, please. Where are we going to get the oil? Well, this is a, a, a slide which shows you all the countries that have oil reserves. And the question here, if you look down the, the list, uh, I have a different slide that will show you who's actually an exporter, because not everybody who's a producer, like the United States, is, a, is an exporter. But in terms of leading countries for proven oil reserves, up at the top you've got Saudi Arabia, <laughs> Canada, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, UAE, Venezuela, Russia, Libya, Nigeria. 
and then you get to the countries that are big producers but importers like the United States and China and maybe even Mexico soon. And so the question is, do you want to buy your economic life insurance from these countries? And I think there from a national security perspective, the answer is probably not. Are these countries going to be able to produce what, what the market needs? Also a question. Next slide, please. The other thing about the future is if you look at the oil in the Caspian and the oil in West Africa, and countries which aren't in OPEC tend to produce as much as they can, sell as much as they can, get the money in, and then it's gone. They're going to peak, and unless there are big new discoveries and unless something else, something else happens that certainly can happen because technology changes you know, dramatically. World oil reserves are greater now than they were 30 years ago because nobody knew we could access offshore oil. But given what we know right now, Dependence on OPEC will increase by 2030 as the non-OPEC sources decline and the countries that are in OPEC, which have these huge reserves, control the world's uh, oil supply. Now, it's still only about 49 or 50 percent, but that's a big control of the market. Next slide. <clears throat> um, and that leads you to, to two problems. One problem is if the world needs this much oil, will the countries get it? And if they do... So, you, sorry, to restate the problem, there's two problems. One is the world needs all this oil, and the countries that are at the bottom of the list actually produce it and get rich. The other problem is the world needs all this oil, and these countries don't meet what that call on OPEC is, don't meet what the market needs, and then you have the economic dislocation. I think the prospects that they actually won't produce what the market will need are greater than the, they will, because if you look at how much it would take to get OPEC's oil production up to 50 more million, 54 million barrels a day. That's if you project what the demand is in 2030 about what would need to come from OPEC. And you see Saudi Arabia has to grow to like 16 million barrels a day. Iran has to go to over six. Iraq has to, has to go to about 8.5. And you look there and the tops are the percentage of growth. Now, what are the odds that Venezuela is going to grow at 3% a year for the next 20 years when they've been declining for the last four? Not great. What's the prospect that Saudi Arabia is going to go to 16? Well, the Saudis don't really want to. And so, so that's not very good. Iran, what was the last time Iran's production capacity grew? OPEC's production capacity, in most cases, is actually smaller now than it was in 1973. So I think the prospects of huge growth from these countries in this era of resource nationalism is pretty slim. Next slide. And we talked about this one. Next slide. So... So, so that's the, the sort of the setup for the problem is you've got this huge demand. Maybe you get the money. Maybe you don't. But it's actually not the worst problem because if you deal with the economic consequences, the question is what are the national security consequences? And if you look today, dependence of our allies and friends and competitors on oil is trashing our foreign policy. And if you look at first, the first reason is, is coalitions fracturing. And, and there, you know, coming from, from experience at the State Department and the Energy Department, you know, you've got a problem. The first thing you do is you call the permanent five members of the Security Council. You know, and you get the British online, and then you get the French online, and then you try and get the Russians to come along, and, you know, and then you hope the Chinese are going to abstain. And that used to be how you deal with Iran or Iraq or Somalia or Bosnia. But you can't do it anymore. In fact, with Iraq, before the war, before anything else, Colin Powell tried to get smart sanctions on, on Saddam. Let's try and tighten the noose a little bit. Let's keep containment going. But could we get the French and the Russians on board? No. Why? Because those 24 oil fields that they had contracts on in violation of UN sanctions. Sudan, you know, the Chinese aren't in favor of genocide in Sudan. But why won't the Chinese go along with sanctions on there? Well, you know, they built the, the, the pipeline. They built the refinery. It's a huge amount of investment. They actually take that oil from there. They're not going to wipe that out over oil and take, and take that hit. Um, and, and over Iran, for 20 years, we've been arguing with the Europeans about containing Iran so they don't get a nuclear program. We had a critical dialogue that wasn't critical and wasn't much of a dialogue either. But why wouldn't the Europeans go along with getting tough on Iran before they actually had a nuclear program? They're a big importer. They're a big investor. They're a big supplier. They were there. We weren't. And so... Coalitions fracturing is a growing problem. Loss of global influence. People don't care what we think anymore in parts of the world where we really wish that they did. You know, and you can look around the world, you know, to look at Russia, you know, sort of first the press goes and then the business goes and then the governors are taken out and you have a renationalization of the industry. You know, democracy kind of disappeared in Russia. What'd you hear from Europe? Not much. Where's Europe get its gas? Russia. Where's it getting a lot of its oil? Russia. Where's it got investment? Russia. Where's a new pipeline to Germany coming from Russia to supply gas? Russia. You're going to hear the Europeans complain about democracy in Russia? No. 
Did we complain all that much? We were hoping for Stockman, this big field that all our companies were going to get into. Guess what? Nobody got it. So, so people don't care what we think in Russia. In, and we'll talk about a little bit more in some of the other categories. But in Africa, you know, we're trying to sell transparency and governance, lift your economies up. But the Chinese are coming in and saying, you know, no strings. We just want to invest. We just want to help you, help you develop. How much are African governments caring what the United States has to say or think? Less and less. They do care in some places, but not in others. Latin America, you'll have Bernardo Alvarez tomorrow, who's a, who's a, who's a terrific guy. I don't consider him an adversary. Venezuela is a competitor. But they got, they got a story to sell in Latin America, and that's that their way is better. We don't have a story to sell in Latin America right now. So when he says, you have a free trade agreement, you can't sell your soybeans in Bolivia, we'll buy them all. Argentina, you want to tell the IMF to go buy a hike, take a hike? We'll buy all your bonds. What's the United States' response? We don't really have a response. It's not the right thing to do, is kind of what our diplomacy says. So in things that we care about, people don't care so much about, about what we say, either in markets or in transparency or in democracy. The third problem is the impunity of the oil rich and resulting instability. Impunity is, you know, when you have that much wealth, you don't have to care what anybody thinks. You don't have to care what your taxpayers think because they don't actually have to pay taxes to run the government. But you know, for Chavez to run a foreign policy where he is buying bonds from Argentina and nationalizing companies and buying soybeans from Bolivia takes money. Oil's at $25. You can't afford that foreign policy. $25, Russia can't afford that foreign policy. $25, Saudi Arabia can't afford its foreign policy or it can't afford to turn its back on or neglect one, some of the money that's leaking out of that country. And so there's an impunity that comes with that much wealth. And instability, the University of Chicago, I have to have my proper footnotes. You know, if you talk about the resource curse and the paradox of plenty, and we all quote Terry Lynn Carl because it was her phrase, her research, and that we're all, we're all, uh, we've all been pirating with attribution when, uh, when we can. But, the, you know, the basic theory is these oil-rich countries get unstable because bad things happen to their economy, and you can hear it directly from the source, so I'm not going to give it to you now. But when you have oil wealth of this magnitude, the problem gets worse. Nigeria, better or worse than four years ago? Way worse. Problems of succession in the Caspian, better or worse than four years ago? Worse. Russia, better or worse than four years ago? Worse. So I mean, the, the fact that these endemic problems, which is governments don't care what their people think, they don't care what other governments think, they do what they want, they're accountable to no one, gets worse when you have wealth of this magnitude. The fourth problem is the erosion of markets. And this is what Al Hagberg talked about a little bit with the long-term contracts. It's not a big problem now, but it's a problem to watch. This long-term contracts question. China wants to sign deals with any country it can that says it will be guaranteed a supply of oil at a market price if something happens, because it doesn't trust the market. It doesn't trust the United States not to interfere in the market. It doesn't trust the market to provide it when it needs it. So it's not a huge amount of oil right now, so it's not really something to worry about. But the idea that other countries would try and lock up supply and you wouldn't have a liquid market is a problem. And now it's not just China's policy, it's Japan's policy. Japan has gone back to where it was 25 years ago and has as a core tenet of its economic and foreign policy trying to get equity access in oil fields and, and long-term contracts. And that long-term is a problem for the market, as is all the, the resource nationalism issues that you've, that you've heard about from, uh, from others. And it's a problem because it produces volatility, because it means that supply can't meet demand, that things can go bad. And, and as Al said, it takes a long time to fix things in the oil industry. If you decide all of a sudden you've made a huge mistake, you haven't invested for you know, the last 20 years, and now you want to produce another million barrels of oil, you've know, you got to wait eight years to get the money in, do the seismic, drill the well, see if they're there, get the infrastructure, produce that. You just can't do it like that, and bad things can happen in eight years. So it creates volatility in the market. And the last problem is this collective energy security system. And Al Hagberg talked about the IEA. But we invented the IEA. The IEA contained 60 70% of the world's consumers of oil. This wonderful collective energy security system, we pooled resources in the event of a crisis, we pooled technology, we tried to open markets, you know, we really worked together. But now that group has about 40% of the world's consumers. And that's because China and India aren't in, and they need to be. And the question for U.S. foreign policy is when is that going to happen and how can we make it happen quickly? So I've been Cassandra. It's a terrible problem. It's ruining our foreign policy. It's getting work. There's no serious prospect that it's going to change anytime soon. So. Can I just leave now? No, I have, to, I have to have a solution. Next slide. My top 10 list of how we fix the oil problem. Um, there are two big baskets. 
lead at home, and change your foreign policy abroad. The lead at home issue is because we consume 25% of the world's oil. Whatever you've heard about renewables and anything else, understand this about oil in the U.S. economy. It is all about transportation, planes, trains, and automobiles. 75% of every barrel of oil the United States consumes goes in some way towards transportation. You don't fix cars. You don't fix this problem. You can't generate you can't move your car on windmills or on solar or even, you know, even on nuclear energy. Long term, you might have electric cars, you might have an electrical system, you might completely transform the transportation system maybe over 20 years and maybe maybe then solar and wind or gas might be an answer to the transportation problem. But we're 20 years away from that. And so you got to do something in between. Number one, so you got to deal with, have something that deals with demand conservation that increases automobile efficiency. One way to do this is CAFE standards, fuel efficiency standards. But the real word, and Professor Zhang alluded to it before, is, and everybody in Washington knows it, is tax. You raise taxes, it sends a price signal, it's expensive to do this, technologies will appear, the market will respond. Why won't people in Washington who to a person probably know that a carbon tax or a gasoline tax, these days probably a carbon tax for environmental reasons, why won't they just talk about it publicly if it's the only answer? And the answer is fear. And who are they afraid of? You. You know, the, the Gore, you know, the, the, pardon me, the Clinton administration, Clinton and Gore, but it was Gore's idea to have a carbon tax in, you know, 1993, and they tried to push it. It was going to be like 15 cents. And then Lloyd Benson, the Secretary of Treasury, bailed out and said, I'm not on board for this. Then the steel industry went. Then, uh, then you know, count the states that are important. Then Ohio basically went and Pennsylvania went, and it shrunk down to seven cents, maybe five cents or something like that, a little bit of a gasoline tax. And then we lost both houses of Congress. So why do people fear? They fear that people won't understand it, and they'll be angry. But the dirty secret is biofuels, solar, wind, investment technology, none of that will put a dent in this problem. 82 million barrels a day. It's huge. You can't fix it with anything other than a long-term policy and, I think, some sort, of a, some sort of a tax. So number one, get serious. And I have talked to potential and some current presidential candidates on one side of the aisle. I'll leave to you to guess which one. And they all care about the problem. You know, they all understand. You get to the first part of this slideshow. I've given it to them, too. You know, and they go, yes, yes, problem, deal with it. Then you say tax, and they're like, oh. So it's a problem that needs to be dealt with. The second is technology, and the, the, short, the short answer there is that we need to put money in the places where we need to fix problems that industry won't do by itself, where you have a market failure. And right now, our national technology budget is huge, but it's all driven by congressional earmarks. And so we've got it in the wrong places. So politics aside, which you can't do in Washington, you wipe the slate clean. You can spend the same amount of money on different things and do better. That's what I think we should do. Third is infrastructure. Infrastructure matters. Gas pipelines from Alaska, better refineries. We haven't talked about electricity, but we need a 20, at least a 20th century power grid, if not a 21st century power grid. Modernize our strategic energy defenses. When we have a hurricane, we learned crude oil doesn't help you because you don't run your car on crude oil. So we need not product reserves, but we need a system that provides reserves of products that can be available to the market in places when things go boom. Active terrorism takes out, you know, five Gulf Coast refineries. How are you going to move the, the ambulances? How are you going to move the planes? How are you going to move the automobiles? Product reserves. So get smart about that. And then energy conservation and efficiency across the board. Next slide. A new foreign policy approach. This is a picture of the Beijing summit uh, of the forum on China-Africa cooperation, where you've got everybody in Africa who's a producer, north, south, east, and west, and the Chinese. These people understand marketing. So a new foreign policy approach. The first thing we have to do is understand that this is an asymmetrical problem. You do not actually get countries to allow investment in and produce more oil by saying, you really ought to do this. It's good for you. You do this by dealing with their problems, not with your problem. And so the first thing that we have to deal with is produce some stability or promote stability in conflict resolutions in the areas that are current producers. You want to add 700 or 500,000 barrels a day of oil to the market in the next two years? Deal with the Niger Delta. Would you like to have had a couple million barrels of oil more than you have right now? Maybe you do a rock differently. 
So uh, in the Middle East, in Africa, and Latin America, you've got to deal with conflict resolution in those countries. Second, I've talked about a little bit, modernize the collective energy security system. You get China and India at the table with you, talking about access, talking about reciprocity, talking about some of these issues. You're in a whole different ballgame with the producers than you are right now. Third is promote reform and transparency. And it's hard because it produces instability in some places. And because you can have all the international oil companies in the U.S. and Europe for transparency, for reform, anti-corruption, but if everybody else who's competing in those countries doesn't play by the same rules, you either lose the bid or you're ineffective. So we have to make it a priority of U.S. foreign policy, and with all due respect, it's not. On the top five talking points of the president with China, when the Chinese president came, did they talk about energy at all? According to both sides, no. When our president talks to the president of Nigeria, any time over the last two years, do they talk about reform and transparency? No. We talk about Sierra Leone. We talk about Liberia. We talk about the elections. We talk about, you know, Charles Taylor. Take him. Don't take him. You know, we have a whole list of things that we want him to do in other places, but we don't talk to them about their country. And we don't send the signal to our own companies and to other countries that it is an important part of our foreign policy with you. You get the meeting with the president. You get the state dinner if you do this stuff as opposed to other stuff. And if you don't have that, it doesn't work. We need to do it. The fourth is we need to promote a free market in energy, and what, uh, what two of my writers called wield the monopsony wedge. Um, and I'm here, so you, you all will actually understand what a monopsony wedge is. I had to look it up myself. But, but the idea is that you know it is a huge energy economy, and it will take 20 years, maybe 30 years, to transform it, even if we all started now. So you've got to manage these problems over the next 20 years. You've got to manage these relationships. But one of the things you ought to do is say, if you want access to our market, we ought to get access to yours. And that is where the United States and China have this huge common interest. In, and if you add the Europeans, you know, the Europeans give unfettered access to Russia in their markets. They can buy electricity companies. They can buy grids. They can buy whatever they want. But they can't invest in Russia anymore unless they have a minor share. Well, why don't you just ask for equal treatment and deny them access unless they get it back? The United States is the most open economy in the world. It's a little bit of a nuclear weapon to say, oh, we're going to deny you total access. But you can say you want a free trade agreement with us. We've got to get access. You want some sort of benefit that we're offering, you've got to allow some access because we do need oil and we do need to produce it to get ourselves to the next, to the next phase. And finally, we need to compete asymmetrically, which is to use energy as a tool of soft power, which is you know, another way of saying that you know, when the Chinese go to Africa, they say, we know what you need, roads, railroads, soccer stadiums, schools. We'll give it to you. We'll build it for you. You give us access to this block. We'll pay the market price for the oil block, but we'll give you this too, which our companies can't, can't compete with. But at least they understand that you've got to address the problems of the other country if you want them to do what you want. And that is where the United States no longer competes. In Latin America, we're not talking about social development. We're not talking about poverty. So they don't hear us anymore. They just hear we want what we want, and it didn't work for them in their view, and so they don't want our system. And that's why Chavez is so popular. We have to compete. In Africa... You know, two billion people in the world have no access to electricity. You know, bring light to the masses, literally, you know, and do something for them and show that you're investing in their countries and dealing with their problems. That's political capital for leaders, and that gives them a reason why they can explain that they're going to let international companies in to have access to their resources. So there's all kinds of ways in which energy can be a tool of soft power, and, and we should use it. Next slide. I'm not going to go through this. I have it left for a handout. This basically shows you all the four major problems we have, energy security challenges, the policy-related objectives, and then the technology pathways. And a former undersecretary of energy, Ernie Moniz, who's a is a rocket scientist at, at MIT, did this in a, in a chapter of my book. And it shows you two things that I want you to understand. One is there is no one solution. There's probably 30 solutions that have to be on your list if you want to deal with energy problems. The other, the other thing that I want you to take away from this is that the problem, as I said at the beginning, is not that there isn't a technological answer on how to get from here to there. And it's not a money problem because we're really quite wealthy and so are the other developed countries and we can afford all of these pathways. Where we are poor is in political will and where we are poor is in leadership. And if we had leadership that would stand up and explain to people, we got this serious problem and it's going to cost you to fix it. 
and it won't be a lot, but you got to pay, and you're going to pay in transportation, and maybe we'll give it back to you in technology investment, or maybe we'll give it back to you in payroll tax. But gasoline needs to be more expensive so we don't have to live in the same dangerous world 20 years from now that we live in today. And off on September 12th, the President of the United States had said, I want 50 cents from you this year, 50 cents from you next year, and a quarter of the two years afterwards, people would have saluted say, thank you, yes, sir, for giving me something to do. But that day passed, and we don't act when there's not a crisis. But we're not incapable of acting. So my final message to you is be educated about what it takes. Be reasonable with your leaders. Make your voice heard. And the next time you get a politician coming through with an answer, tell them you actually support the answer that will fix the problem. And then we can fix this problem. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, 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 I should have made clear to the other speakers, you get an extra five minutes if you, if you dwell on the importance of the price system to solve the problem. So please. <laughs> uh, Scott Noman next. Thank you. You know, David's obviously a very knowledgeable and talented speaker. What I envy most about him at this point is he's a native New Yorker and he can talk really, really fast. Uh, <laughs> I'm a native Southern Californian that lives in Texas. I don't talk nearly as fast, and yet I've got a lot of information that I want to share, but I also want to leave time for questions. So I'll give you the very briefest of introductions. I manage the corporate planning group for ExxonMobil in Dallas. Uh, what I'm going to share with you tonight is a outlook not to next week or next month or next year, but a long-term outlook, one to the year 2030. This is not for external purposes only. This is exactly the same information, exactly the same presentation that we share with our management committee, with our board, with our employees. This is what we build our business on. I'm going to cover a variety of areas, uh, the role of different fuels in the future. I'm going to talk about biofuels a little bit. And at the end, I want to talk about uh, some of the implications, particularly with respect to CO2 uh, of this outlook. So with that, as an introduction, and I'm going to challenge you in terms of the slides, because I'll have lots of next, please, but next, please. Fundamentally, the world needs energy. It needs energy because of two primary drivers. The population is growing, and the economy is growing on a global basis. This chart looks at the global population from the year 1950 through the year 2030. The world's divided into two pieces here, the OECD in red, the non-OECD in blue. Uh, we make that distinction because the developed economies, the OECD, however you want to uh, refer to them, have significantly different trends than do the developing economies, the non-OECD. And so as I go through this, you're going to see that distinction. The reason for that distinction is the trends are different. This slide, what I want to highlight is the fact that in 1950, there were 2.5 billion of us on the planet. Today, it's about 6.5 billion. You can see the numbers in white show the annual percentage growth rate between the year 2000 and 2030. It's only nine-tenths of one percent. doesn't sound like much at all, but by 2030, today's six and a half billion grows to eight billion. That's a lot more people using energy. That's a lot more energy. The key, though, to this chart is where that population growth is occurring. Ninety-five percent of the world's population growth between now and 2030 is occurring in the developing economy. So that's going to be a central theme as I go through this is that's where the energy demand is growing most. Next, please. The other big driver is economic growth. Uh, this shows global GDP, and I know there's some economists in here. This is expressed in market exchange rate. It makes a point. If you did it on purchasing power parity, it would make the point even stronger. Uh, the world's economy continues to grow. We project steady growth in the OECD countries. You can see 2.2%. But the growth is strongest in the developing economies. The non-OECD, we project a growth rate more than double what we've seen in the OECD. So we've got the combination of strong population growth, strong economic growth. Next slide, please. So when we look at total world energy, this is oil, gas, coal, renewables, nuclear, all expressed on an oil equivalent basis. This is the result. Today, the world uses about 230 million barrels per day of oil equivalent. That's growing at about 1.6 percent. That'll get us to 330 million barrels per day by the year 2030. You can see most of the growth, three times the rate of growth, is in the developing economies. And I'll come back to that again. Next, please. 
Same data, shown a different way. GDP on the x-axis, uh, global energy demand on the y-axis. Two key points here. As the world's economy grows, so grows the demand for energy. Those are linked. Uh, the other point that's maybe not as obvious is it's not a straight line. The line is flattening with time. That reflects a decrease in the world's energy intensity. From a practical standpoint, it means that we have and will continue to have more efficiency. That's more efficient cars, more efficient lights, appliances, manufacturing processes. When we build our outlook and we look to the future, we expect these efficiency gains to continue in the future. Next, please. If those don't occur, if the energy intensity stays fixed where it is today, that would add an incremental 140 million barrels per day oil equivalent, almost double what we use today. As someone that spent my life in the business of supplying energy, I can tell you that's not in anyone's interest to have that high of a demand. So efficiency is important, and it's, it's important throughout uh, all the sectors. Next, please. I mentioned how much energy we use. Let's talk about what kind of energy that is. This is the same chart today, 230 million barrels per day, oil equivalent growing to about 330 by 2030. The color slices show the breakdown of the type of energy. Liquids in green, most of that's oil. Uh, you can see it's growing at 1.4 percent. Uh, as David mentioned, that's largely due to transportation. The next two slides, or next two slices, in red and blue, are natural gas and coal. Those are driven by the demand for power. More than anything in the developing economies, we need to deliver electricity. The fuels of choice tend to be natural gas and coal, so you can see that we expect those to continue to grow at a rapid pace. Stop for a second. If you combine the green, the red, and the blue, fossil fuels today, they're about 80 percent of the energy the world consumes. Our projection is that that percentage will not change appreciably by the year 2030. I like to tell people that's not because I'm in the oil and gas business. I believe that's because that's a pragmatic view of the future. We've talked about the IEA. If you look at the IEA's reference case, they too see a world with about 80 percent fossil fuel meeting the world's demand by the year 2030. Finally, there's other. Other gets a lot of uh, discussion. Next slide, please. Others made up of a variety of things. On the bottom is biomass. Uh, that's uh, wood, wood chips, charcoal. Most of that's uh, animal dung. Uh, interestingly enough, if you look at the slice right above it, there's more energy demand met globally by those traditional fuels than by nuclear power. That's a perspective that I think most of us would not have on a going-in basis. We believe nuclear power will grow. If you look closely, you can see it flaring kind of in the year 2020 and beyond. But even with some new growth in Europe, with new growth in North America, it's still growing at a rate of about 1.4 percent. It's a relatively small portion of the world's total energy today. Hydroelectric geothermal, uh, most of the growth there is China and India. Uh, grows 2.2 percent, but obviously there's a limit to that. The final slice on top is wind and solar. Next, next slide. We've got a very aggressive outlook for wind and solar, higher than the EIA, higher than the IEA. We do that on purpose. We err on the side of, of estimating high to make a point. We believe that those two in combination will grow at a rate greater than 10 percent a year. Compounded over 30 years, that is a huge amount of growth. Uh, there will be billions of dollars invested in the wind business, billions of dollars invested in the solar business. We're not currently in that business. We were one of the pioneers in the solar business, but we're not in, in that today. But they're legitimate businesses, and they will attract a lot of investment. The perspective here is, even with 10 percent growth annually over 30 years, the amount of energy from wind and solar by 2030 will be approaching 3 million barrels per day. That's a lot of energy in the absolute, but that's 3 million barrels per day out of 330 million barrels per day total. It's less than 1 percent. So perspective is important in understanding these issues. Next slide, please. Want to talk about liquids. That's the fuel most people are familiar with. This is a sectoral breakdown of where we use liquids. Transportation, by far the biggest area. It's grown about 1.8 percent on a global basis. The other big use is industrial uses, making uh, plastics, for example, and you can see that in blue. Residential, commercial, power gen, the bottom two slices, they're small and not increasing much. Next slide, please. If you look at transportation, the breakdown on a global basis is about a third of that is light-duty vehicles. That's cars, pickup trucks, SUVs. About a third is commercial trucks. 
The rest is aviation, marine, and rail. We look at each of these separately. We talk to people that are experts in these fields. We have close relationships with the U.S. automakers, with people like Toyota and Honda, Caterpillar for heavy uh, use. We look at efficiency gains. We look at technology. I'm going to step you through just a very brief description of light-duty vehicles to give you a feel for how we project into the future. Next slide, please. This relationship I find interesting. It's true for every country in the world, whether you're in the U.S., whether you're in the U.K., Russia, Kazakhstan, Brazil. As per capita income rises, the ownership of vehicles rise. This is a typical curve that shows there's a threshold. Once reached, you start to increase the amount of vehicle ownership. That threshold is give or take $1,000 a head. It increases as incomes rise, and then you reach a saturation point in very affluent societies where that a uh, number of vehicles per thousand people, which is on the y-axis, levels off. Next, please. These are real-world examples. We've been accumulating data for years and years. Each little dot, if you have a good eye, is a year. So it's about 25 years' worth of China data, about 25 years' worth of South Korea, about 40 years' worth of U.S. data. If you look at China, 25 years ago, per capita income was about $1,000 a head. Virtually no cars in China. As incomes have risen, so has the ownership of vehicles. Today, still a relatively low 10 per thousand people. South Korea, look at South Korea's growth over time. Today, there are over 200 vehicles per thousand people. Uh, said another way, China is, with respect to vehicles, where South Korea was about 15 years ago, growing in affluence, growing in number. The epitome of the country at saturation is the U.S. We've got 760 light-duty vehicles per thousand people in the U.S. That's more than one per driver. That is leveling off, but it's reflective of the point where developed economies grow. They grow to very high concentrations of vehicles. So we take this kind of data. We have economic projections, population projections by country. That allows us to project the number of vehicles. Next slide, please. This is what you get. Uh, in the OECD, we expect the number of light-duty vehicles to grow at about 1% per year, relatively slow. That's slow population growth, a lot of countries near saturation level. Five times the rate of growth in the non-OECD countries. That's not just China. It's all of the developing countries in the world. To put that in numeric perspective, between the year 2000 and 2030, the non-OECD countries will add half a billion light-duty vehicles, 500 million light-duty vehicles. That's a huge amount of fuel energy that we'll need to add to the mix. And so that's, again, part of the driver, the growing economies in these areas. Next slide. I'm going to take a little segue through the U.S. data to give you a feel for uh, some of the factors that we uh, build in. Many of you are familiar with this kind of data. This is new uh, light-duty vehicle trends in the U.S., 1980 through 2005. The vehicles we drive have been getting progressively heavier. That's more SUVs, that's more light-duty pickup trucks, that kind of thing. Next slide, please. You're also familiar with the fact that new vehicles in the U.S. have shown no fuel economy improvements over the last 20 years. Now, I'm an engineer. I look at this and say, well, that's kind of fascinating. More weight, but the same fuel economy means there's efficiency gains that are being masked by this weight increase. As we talk to automakers, they say that's right, and we've got further efficiencies that we're working on for the future. Next slide. A little mental game you can play is, well, what if the world had kept vehicle weights, or what if the U.S. had kept vehicle weights constant with their 1980 level? What would fuel economy have done? It had improved at about 1.3 percent per year, and you can see by now it would be substantially higher than what it is. As we project into the future, we anticipate that this fuel efficiency that's occurring under, hood, under the hood, this technology efficiency, will begin to show up as improved fuel economy. So we build in new vehicles as having better fuel economy, and that helps dampen some of the growth that we see. Next, please. I'm going to talk very briefly about these. These are a subset of those new vehicles that I'll call advanced technology. The best example is hybrid electric cars. Toyota's the leader in this field. We've worked closely with them for a number of years. I'd say we're bullish on this technology. Combination of electric motor, internal combustion engine with a large battery pack that allows a more efficient operation. The electric motor runs when the car is going at slow speeds, the internal combustion at high speeds, and being able to achieve the appropriate balance gives you a vehicle that's about 30% more efficient than a standard vehicle. Next slide, please. 
There are other technologies, this is a mouthful, homogeneous charge compression ignition, HCCI. Every automaker is working on some form of this. It is a better way uh, to combust fuel. You get, uh, it's much like a diesel engine, it works on compression, but because you get better fuel air mixing, you more efficiently combust the fuel that's above the piston, you get a higher efficiency. This is technology that's evolving and may in fact uh, be on the road within 10, 15 years. Again, probably something in the neighborhood of 30% improvement in efficiency. Next slide, please. We believe that whether it's hybrid or HCCI or something we can't identify today, that these vehicles will become more and more prevalent in the fleet. Uh, you can see by the year 2030, we would expect 30% of new vehicle sales would fall in this advanced technology uh, pot. Next slide, please. But because there's a time lag, it takes time to turn over the entire fleet, even with that rate of growth, it's only about 10% of the total vehicles will be this advanced technology by the year 2030. So it's hard to move a fleet that's this large and last on average for 13 or 14 years, but it does make an impact. Same slide I showed you before, overall about 2% growth in the number of light duty vehicles. Next, please. That small cross-hatched area is the advanced vehicle portion of this. You can see that's relatively small, but because it's adding so much efficiency, it has an impact. And you see that in the next slide, where we project light-duty fuel demand on a global basis to grow at about 1% per year. A couple of interesting things about this. If you look at the OECD, our expectation for light-duty fuel demand in the U.S., in the U.K., Western Europe, Japan, South Korea, is that by the year 2030, demand for those light fuels will be about the same as what it was in the year 2000. That obviously has implications from a business strategy in terms of where you do and you do not build new refining capacity. And I'll be happy to talk about that later. I'm sure people are going to have questions about refining capacity. But Again, kind of internalize, if this is your view of the future, where would you build your new refining capacity? You're going to build it where demand is increasing. That's in the non-OEC countries. And so companies like mine are building refining capacity in places like China. That's where the demand is increasing. So some of this corporate strategy is fairly straightforward once you have a view of what the future looks like. Next, please. If you add all that up, light-duty fuels, heavy-duty fuels, trains, planes, uh, commercial use, industrial use, this is the projection you get into the future. Uh, David said the world consumes 82 million barrels per day. That's how fast it's growing. We're actually consuming about 85 million barrels per day today. Uh, that's a hard number to get your arms around, even for those of us in the business. Let me put perspective on that. 85 million barrels per day. Every second, that's 40,000 gallons of oil. That's how big the business that I'm in is. 40,000 gallons every second. That's how much the world is consuming. We believe that 85 will grow to about 115 million barrels per day by 2030. Next slide. That will come from uh, pretty much the same places it comes from today. Conventional crude oil, condensate from gas wells. You can see the big green swath. Uh, up at the top, there's the dark green labeled oil sands. That's heavy oil production from places like Canada and Venezuela. We expect that to grow. NGLs, those are natural gas liquids, propanes, butanes that come from the processing of natural gas. As the world uses more natural gas, we'll get more of those liquids. Other includes gas to liquids, coal to liquids, shale oil. You can see those are relatively small today. We expect those to be relatively small still by 2030. And then finally, and I'll come back to it, biofuels at the very top is the gold band. You can see today that it's hard to see it at this scale on a global basis. We expect it to grow, but perspective's important. And again, I'll come back to that. Major projects. I'm, I'm a technologist by background, and I believe in technology. I believe in the importance of technology. And so I want to take you on a quick trip around the world and give you some firsthand examples of how technology is allowing us to find and develop new resources. So I'm going to take you on a trip that starts in Africa, then goes off the Pacific coast of Russia, and then we'll swing back closer to home to Canada. Next, please. This is off the coast of Angola. It's a development called Kazamba A. Uh, the vessel you see in the foreground is called a floating production storage and offloading vessel. It is probably the largest vessel you've ever seen. It is over 1,000 feet long. It's larger than an aircraft carrier. It receives production from the platform in the upper left. This is a massive undertaking in terms of engineering and construction. 
but that's not the most impressive part of it. The most impressive part to me is the fact that this production is occurring in over 4,000 feet of water. Let me give you a little perspective on that. 20 years ago, I was responsible for designing and installing platforms in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico. The record at that time, the record water depth was right at 1,000 feet. That was 20 years ago. Today we're producing from 4,000, 5,000 feet of water. That's how fast the technology improves. That allows us to open up the deep waters of Africa. It allows us to add to the world's resource base. Next, please. Next stop on our trip will be Sakhalin Island off the coast of Russia. Go ahead. This is Sakhalin Island, not where you want to take your vacation. I can tell you that from firsthand experience. It is bitterly cold, so cold that in the wintertime, the sea ice goes all the way from the seafloor to the surface. It ridges at the surface, piles up, it gouges the seafloor. So if you bury pipelines, it has to be deep enough that it doesn't suffer ice gouge. It's also an area that's subject to a lot of seismic activity, a lot of earthquakes. Ten years ago, I was responsible for the uh, project design, project planning for this development. And the task we had in front of us was, how do we develop a field that is six miles offshore of Sockland Island, given all these conditions? Very difficult from an engineering standpoint, but we said, you know, if we had enough steel, enough concrete, we could do that, but the economics would be difficult. Next, please. Ten years have passed. They got better development planners than me, and they came up with a different plan. And so today, that blue rig, which is the world's largest drilling rig, drills wells that go down over a mile and then go horizontally six miles. Six miles horizontally, and at the end of that six miles, we can hit a target much smaller than this room perspective again. Ten years ago, we could not do that. We did not have the technology to do that. More importantly, ten years ago, we did not think this technology would develop in a time frame that was applicable to Sockland's development. And yet today we're producing 250,000 barrels from Sockland Island. That's how fast the technology changes. And finally, this isn't all applicable just only to places far away, right in our own backyard. Alberta, Canada uh, possesses huge amounts of what is termed heavy oil. That is a misnomer. If I had a glass of this stuff and turned it upside down, it would not pour out. That's how heavy heavy oil is. I'm not going to try to describe all this to you in industry parlance. That's a lot of pots and pans. It's a lot of technology. It's a lot of investment. But we can take that tar-like material and turn it into a light fluid that we can run through a normal refinery and ultimately into vehicle fuels. Again, greatly expanding the resource base. I'm bullish on technology. It's going to help us stretch the supply base. These are examples. Now I want to show you some numeric uh, implications of all this. How much oil will we recover? That's a question everybody asked. There was a question earlier about peak oil. Let me give you a little perspective on our view of the world's resource base. Conventional crude and condensate, everything but shale oil and heavy oil, Estimated by the U.S. Geological Survey, USGS, that's uh, 1984 through 2000. They've done five assessments of the global recoverable oil. You can see they've increased with time. That reflects this ongoing march of technology. Technology continues to surprise us. Today, the USGS would say that we'll recover about 3.3, 3.4 trillion barrels of oil. ExxonMobil's proprietary view is just about the same. It may vary from country to country, but on a global basis, if you take technical data and have engineers and geoscientists look at it, you come to a very similar answer. But that's not all the oil we have. I said that's just conventional. Next, please. When you add heavy oil, shale oil, what we call frontier oil, now we're up to over 4 trillion barrels of recoverable oil. One number I know for sure, one number that I can help with perspective. Next slide, please. Since the beginning of time, since the first person scooped some oil up out of a seep off the ground, we have consumed about one trillion barrels of oil. That's four trillion that we'll recover, of which we've only recovered one. The notion that we're halfway through the inventory, the notion that we're at an impending peak, does not meet a technical test. It is not valid from a technical standpoint. This is a very simplistic example, but we are not in any way subscribers to the notion that we are at an imminent peak in oil production. Next, please. I just mentioned earlier that oil may be the best example of a global, uh, globally traded commodity. Uh, I certainly uh, subscribe to that. This is a picture of the global oil trade in the year 2000. Region to region, there was about 35 million barrels per day that moved from one region to another. You can see by the colors where they were emanating from and where they were going to, a lot from the Middle East, a lot from Africa. 
How will that change over time? Next slide. One more, please. Year 2030, that 35 million barrels per day grows to 55 million barrels per day. More will, in fact, as David mentioned, come from the Middle East. Uh, the lion's share of that will head east to where the demand is, to Asia. Uh, Africa will become a bigger producer. Russia and the Caspian will become bigger producers. Key point I want to make here, a lot of suppliers, a lot of consumers. The world that we live in is interdependent. There's a lot of talk about becoming energy independent. That is not the world we live in today. That is not the world we'll live in in the future. We're becoming more and more dependent on one another. Next, please. Biofuels. I just got back from a trip to Russia and Kazakhstan. Talked to students at Moscow State, talked to uh, technical students in Kazakhstan. Everybody wanted to know about biofuels. So that's not unique to the U.S. It's not unique to the Midwest. So let me give you just a brief perspective on this. Again, this is the share of biofuels today and in the future, according to our outlook. That's thin gold line at the top. Next, please. If you look on a volume basis at biofuels, that's biodiesel, but more it's ethanol. About 90% of what's classified as biofuel is, is ethanol. Uh, very slow growth to about the year 2000, then a very rapid ascension. We believe that will continue. You can see that in the dashed line. We believe governments will continue to support the development of the biofuels industry. Uh, we grow it at about 7% a year. Parenthetically, it says volume basis. That's because a gallon of ethanol has about two-thirds the energy of gasoline. So if you're doing an energy balance, you have to take that into account. Next, please. When you take that into account, you get the solid line. Again, billions of dollars going to be invested in biofuels. Companies will make a living off of biofuels. It's a very large amount of energy, approaching 2 million barrels per day by the year 2030. That's 2 million barrels per day out of 115 million barrels per day. It's less than 2%. So it's still relatively small, and that's an important point to make. Next, please. Biofuels today come primarily from Brazil, sugarcane, from the U.S., corn. Some comes from Europe, some comes from the rest of the world, whether that's palm oil in Malaysia or sugar from Thailand. I want to talk about the U.S. and Brazil just briefly. Next slide, please. My parents are from Kansas. That's corn country. Illinois is corn country, so is Iowa, Nebraska, the heartland. Uh, the average farmer will grow an acre of corn and get about 350 gallons of ethanol. That's the yield from an acre of corn. We can calculate the cost of that corn, the cost of distilling that corn into an alcohol. That's about $2 per gallon. That excludes tax, that excludes distribution, excludes retail. It literally, if you're standing at the outlet of an ethanol refinery in Iowa, it's about $2 a gallon. Perspective. $60 per barrel crude, we can make a gallon of gasoline for about $1.80. Again, that excludes tax, distribution, retail. Said another way, until prices get to about $70 per barrel crude, ethanol from corn cannot compete on a straight-up economic basis. So there is a cost challenge. But probably more important is the scale challenge. In the year 2005, the U.S. produced 4 billion gallons of ethanol. It sounds like a huge amount, yet it met just about 2% of our gasoline demand. It took 13% of our corn crop. 2006, our production exceeded 5 billion gallons, still met only about 3% of our gasoline demand, took 20% of the corn crop. All of you have heard, all of you are aware of the fact that the price of corn has gone up and it's had implications in the food and feed market. Scale is an issue with respect to corn. People will come back and say, well, what about Brazil? Can't they do it much more efficiently? So let's look at Brazil. Farmers in Brazil, for a variety of reasons, can get a much higher yield per acre than we can here in the U.S., closer to 600, 650 gallons per acre. Sugar, more sugar and sugar cane, higher energy density per acre, lower labor costs. They're able to use some of the waste for power in Brazil, uh, abundant rainfall. So they can produce a gallon of ethanol for about a dollar. So price is not the issue on Brazilian ethanol. Scale again is. Next slide. U.S. consumes a little over 9 million barrels per day of gasoline. Brazil consumes about 1 20th that amount. People will tell you, well, the Brazilians fuel all their cars or get most of their uh, car fleet fueled by ethanol. So let's look at that. Next, please. Brazil and the U.S. produce about the same amount of ethanol. That does, in fact, cover 40% of Brazil's needs. It would only cover, only covers 2% of the U.S. need. Again, 
scale, a huge issue. When we talk about the size, the global appetite for liquids, we have to take this into account. Next, please. And finally, there's cellulosic ethanol, the promise of the future from uh, switchgrass, from wood chips and whatnot. Very high yield, potentially. Uh, today, uh, on a pilot scale basis, on a laboratory basis, you can get cellulosic ethanol for something in the neighborhood of three to four dollars per gallon. Next, please. The challenge here is not so much where we get the source material from, anything that's got cellulose in it, that could be grass, that could be wood. The bottom part we know, fermentation, distillation, been doing that for centuries, uh, know how to do that. All that stuff in the middle in the box called underdevelopment. Anything from finding ways to separate cellulose from the rest of the plant, which is no easy task. Today it's using high pressure steam to literally blast the plant apart at lab scale. Or bioengineering enzymes that will react with that cellulose and turn it into a sugar. Or finding ways to take the multitude of sugars that that produces and distill them into alcohols. We do quite a bit of research on a variety of things. We know how long it takes to get from lab pilot scale to commercial applicability. We also are doing work on cellulosic ethanol. You noticed we did not have cellulo cellulosic ethanol listed on our liquid chart. That's because we don't believe there will be material commercial volumes by the year 2030. That is also the outlook of the Department of Energy. There is no commercial volumes of cellulosic ethanol in their current outlook in the year 2030. The technology is just too immature. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but it means if you're looking at policy, you certainly don't want to count on it as a sure thing. Next slide, please. Now, that's a very quick run through liquids. I take you through gas and coal and say, you know, the world is using a lot more gas, a lot more coal, and in some respects, all of that's good. A lot more energy is allowing a lot more economic growth. It's raising the prosperity, literally, of billions of people. It also comes with a challenge, a global challenge, and you see it here. It's the level of CO2 that comes with all that oil, all that gas, and all that coal. Today, the world produces about 25 billion tons of CO2. We project that even with efficiency gains, even with growth in renewables, even with pub public policy, to grow at about 1.6% per year approaches 40 billion tons by the year 2030. This is a concern, and that's right. You heard somebody from ExxonMobil actually say this is a concern. CO2 going into the atmosphere is a global concern. And uh, we are famous, and others have described our position typically incorrectly uh, in terms of our views on climate change and the linkage to CO2. I will say that there's much that we don't understand, but there's plenty that we do understand. And we understand enough to know that we need to look at what our options are and what we can do to reduce the CO2 that we emit from the energy we need. Next slide, please. We have options. That's the good news. We could build more nuclear plants, but that has cost issues, more expensive. We'd have to figure out where to put them, what to do with the waste. We have options that you hear about in terms of carbon capture and sequestration injecting CO2 into the ground. There's technical challenges to that. It's never been done on anything even approaching the scale that we would need globally. But uh, I have faith, we have faith that that technology will evolve, but it will cost more. Up in the upper right is an example of advanced vehicles, but there's many examples of ways we can become more efficient. People ask, how can we reduce the amount of CO2 from the energy we use? The best answer is use less energy. I'm in favor of that. We're in favor of that. Don't use as much of our product. That would be great. That's a way to reduce the amount of CO2. And finally, there's the opportunity for breakthroughs, whether that's hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, better solar, better cellulosic ethanol. All of those things and more are being investigated under a program being done at Stanford University, the Global Climate and Energy Project. That's General Electric. That's Toyota, Schlumberger, and ExxonMobil. That is just one of many, many programs that are looking at ways to generate energy with less of an impact from CO2. Next, please. A little one chart to kind of stimulate a thought process. This is, I characterize this as the beginning of a long dialogue that we see ourselves playing a part in. 
The sector that has the largest emissions of CO2 is power generation. It's about 40% of the world's total CO2 comes from this sector. The exact numbers aren't important. It's important to understand that there are variables here that we need to consider. And one is the size of the sector, in this case power generation, and the cost of avoiding the CO2. Next, please. Another place to look is our cars, light duty transport. Much smaller target doesn't mean we don't look at it, doesn't mean it's not important, doesn't mean there's not opportunities, but it's perspective. It's much smaller in terms of target. Here, what can we do? Well, rather than that gasoline car that I drive today, maybe in the future I'll buy a hybrid that's more efficient, costs more, uh, put ethanol in my car, lower CO2, higher cost. Uh, next slide, please. These are the costs on the same basis, dollars per ton, of those options. And you can see they're much, much higher. Now, again, I'm not trying to say don't look at cars, don't look at trying to come up with more efficient fuels. My point here is there's trade-offs, there's choices, and we need to understand what those are. And if we're going to make effective policy, we need to start having these substantive discussions as opposed to rhetorical discussions. Next, please. So, in summary, we need a lot more energy. The world needs a lot more energy. 60% more energy by 2030 than we used in the year 2000. It's driven by population growth, which is going to occur. It's driven by economic growth. That's going to occur. The types of fuels we use in the future, I am confident, are going to look a lot like the ones we use today. Oil, gas, and coal will be the predominant fuels. That is a pragmatic view of the future. Energy resources, I talked about oil. If you look at coal, if you look at natural gas, they're adequate. David highlighted uh, some of the challenges. There's different views on whether or not that resource which exists will be brought on production, whether that will be productive capacity. I believe it will. Others may not have as much optimism. The key here is a lot of investment, a lot of technology required. Technology. I've mentioned it about a dozen times. Let me mention it one more time. I believe in technology. I don't actually work for an energy company or an oil and gas company. I work for a technology company been in business for over 100 years. If you work for the company I do, at the core of our business, everything we do is a belief in technology. It will stretch our supply. It'll help us mitigate demand. And if you're really, really concerned about CO2, if you're concerned about finding solutions to reducing the amount of CO2, technology is by far the best bet we have. Last slide. I want to thank you for your attention. This is all, from my standpoint, not about an advertisement for ExxonMobil. I'm not trying to get you to buy more of our gas or motor oil. If, if you want to, that's great. But what this is about is everyone becoming better educated in terms of some of these energy issues. And again, it won't be a commercial, but if you go to ExxonMobil.com and look under Energy Outlook, there's a lot more material. I'd ask, share it with yourself, with your neighbors, with your friends, with your families, because this is probably the most important series of issues that most of us will face in our lifetimes. The more we know about it, the better off we'll be. Thank you for your attention on a Friday night, and I look forward to your questions. Michael Clay. I don't have slides. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, so long evening, but um, in, in the vein of our, uh, the, the very last comment we heard, I want to stimulate a little discussion, so I hope we have some discussion. And, um, and I, I, I hope to stimulate that. Uh, you just heard that we have to increase energy by 60% of between now and 2030. So a lot of my, my comments are, are about two things. What happens if we don't? And I think the chances are better than 50-50 that we will not. And secondly, what happens when there's a struggle between us and everybody else in the world over this diminished supply, less than the 60% more? How's that going to play out? Because that's the real world we're going to be facing. Okay? That's the backdrop for what I'm going to talk about. But in the interests of having a conversation. Now, you heard some discussion about peak oil and some skepticism expressed about that. Um, and I'm not going to talk about peak oil per se, uh, or at least the part about 
where the peak is and how high and where it's going to go. But I, I do want to refer to a report just published by the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, called Crude Oil. Uncertainty about future oil supply makes it important to develop a strategy for addressing a peak and decline in oil production. Uh, and this was done by, by uh, for, at the request of members of Congress. It surveyed the study that was referred to by ExxonMobil um, and a dozen or so others on peak oil and sit, concluded reasonably that we can't be sure about when a peak in world oil production is going to occur. There are different studies. There are the more optimistic ones from ExxonMobil. There are some much more pessimistic that uh, show a peak arriving as soon as 2010, and there are many in between. Um, they don't draw that conclusion. Uh, they do say that a peak is uh, unavoidable, it's coming, and the question is how well will our country be prepared, um, and that if it comes in the early edge, uh, we will face a total economic meltdown, and we, this country will go through a catastrophic economic collapse. That is, if it comes sooner rather than later, because we will not have on hand the kind of alternatives that Scott uh, spoke about. If it comes much later, we'll be in, in better shape. My point is the following. There are two aspects to the peak oil theory that's been developed. There are two points to this theory. One part is that at some point in the future, the global oil industry will reach a maximum sustainable daily output at some number measured in millions of barrels a day. We're now at 85 million barrels a day. Some people say we'll go to 100 million barrels a day. Some, as you just heard, say we'll go considerably higher than that before the numbers will start going down. I'm not interested in that number. We could have a discussion about it. Uh, and of course, the non-conventional sources that you saw on the chart, tar sands, shale oil, will give us a little bit of an edge Above that will last us out. As I say, there are two parts to this theory or this explanation model. The other is that the, as we approach the point of peak oil, at that point we will have used up all of the world's easy to get at oil. Well, that, that means the large reservoirs close to the, close to the surface, close inshore, inshore uh, in friendly countries, stable countries, countries that have governments we could work with, uh, our own country, um, and that as you approach peak oil and move beyond it, that increasingly the supply of oil will be in places that are uh, dangerous, hazardous to operate in for environmental reasons or political reasons, or they're corrupt, uh, you, don't, you don't want to do business there, or there's perpetual instability, strikes, riots, uh, civil wars, uh, or they're in extremely hazardous uh, places to operate, like where, uh, hurricane, persistent hurricanes, like in the Gulf of Mexico, or icebergs. Uh, that This is characteristic of any resource exploitation, because typically, you're going to go after the easy stuff first and leave the hard stuff for later. Um, and if this is accurate, well, the evidence, uh, and you saw some of that, the evidence is pretty conclusive that we are now in that space. The one trillion barrels of oil that Scott told us we have now consumed, that was the easy oil. It is gone. It is finished forever. We will never see it again. There is no more easy oil in the world. Everything that's left is hard oil. It is deep underground, as he explained. It is far offshore in the deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico in areas where hurricanes are not at level three as they were when Katrina hit New Orleans. They are category five hurricanes or in there in places where icebergs gather, where the, where the Titanic went down. 
or in their places that are just chronically corrupt, systematically corrupt, where you just cannot trust uh, the records of the finances, or where their civil war is a perpetual state of affairs, or where there are minorities that do not accept the borders that were drawn by the imperial governments that created these countries half a century or so ago, and so forth. And the evidence in the uh, GAO study, they actually calculated that two-thirds of the world's remaining oil, and this doesn't matter whether you accept it's two trillion barrels left, one trillion barrels left, or three trillion barrels left, that two-thirds of the remaining oil is in, of the remaining reserves are in countries that are in moderate to high risk of having a civil war, a coup d'etat, uh, or persistent outbreak of strikes and internal uh, disorder in the next five years. Political risk, two-thirds of, of the reserves are in such countries. This is telling us that this aspect, at least of the peak oil theory, uh, certainly is conclusive. And I think if you read the professional oil literature, you will see that all of the oil companies will, uh, will explain that this is, the, this is the problem, essentially, that we face. We either have to go to areas that are environmentally hazardous or present the problems that, that ANWA presents, uh, or uh, we're going to go into places like Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan, where we're going to be dealing with corrupt, nepotistic rulers uh, who suppress their own population, where the risk of revolt, ethnic or otherwise, is very high, uh, and where uh, Sakhalin Island, we heard a lot about Sakhalin Island, I have no doubt whatsoever that this was a brilliant piece of engineering. That's Sakhalin 1. Sakhalin 2, which was a shell project, was wiped out by Vladimir Putin just three or four months ago where the $12 billion investment of Shell and two Japanese companies was literally wiped out overnight by the Putin government uh, on the basis of environmental regulations which the government had never bothered with before. I hope that Exxon doesn't suffer the same fate, but this is more than likely to be the fate of companies that invest in the countries of this high-level political risk that I'm talking about. This is systemic to the situation that the oil industry is in today. Now, clearly, this has foreign policy and military policy implications because we, in this country, consume one-fourth of the world's petroleum on a daily basis. And as you saw very clearly, our society, our civilization requires that we get 20 million barrels a day, one-fourth of the, eight, you know, something like that, 21 million barrels a day, one-fourth of that, 84 million barrels a day that the world consumes. And yes, China's going to use more, but we need more too because our population is growing, our economy is growing, we're driving more, we're going to need more. And increasingly, as you look into the future, more and more of that is going to have to come from the handful of countries that are left in the world that have any. And they're all in high-risk countries. There isn't any safe countries left. They're all high-risk countries, every last one of them virtually. They're ruled by governments that actively dislike us, hate us, or are corrupt and unstable, or like Putin, and the others, they seek to exploit us, to steal our money, to take our money, and use it for their own purposes, often uh, purposes that are alien to our own interests. That's, that's the state we're in. And it will get worse. It'll never get better. It'll only get worse. So this is obviously a foreign policy problem and a military problem for the United States. Now, American leaders have responded to this problem over the past decades in a variety of ways. They have searched for solutions. All of the solutions they have found have been disasters. 
one after the other. They've looked for the least bad solution, and the least bad solution has turned out to be as bad or worse than the others they saw. And this is not a new policy, I have to say. And it's not a democratic policy. It's not a Republican response. It is the response of Washington. And it was the first solution was President Roosevelt in 1943, who determined that the, seeing that, and he was the first to understand that America would become dependent on imported petroleum, the first president to grasp this and determined that the solution to our dependency problem was to form, establish a protectorate over Saudi Arabia. Uh, and that to, and, and it, not only a protectorate over Saudi Arabia, but to nationalize the, uh, the Caltex concession, which then became Saudi, Saudi, which then became Aramco before it became Saudi Aramco, the Caltex concession following the model uh, established by his mentor, uh, Mr. Churchill, who had formed a protectorate over Iran and who had nationalized what was called originally the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, later the Anglo-Iranian Company, Oil Company, later British Petroleum, or BP. Uh, he, Roosevelt was thwarted in his effort to nationalize Caltex, but he did establish a relationship with the Saudi royal family by meeting with King Abdulaziz ibn Saud on February 14, 1945, and established a alliance, an oil for protection alliance, whereby the United States would have privileged access to Saudi oil and in return, the United States would agree to protect the Saudi royal family in perpetuity, male heir to male heir, down, down the line. And this is a promise, a pledge that has been kept by every American president since, up until the current president, who you know, fathered a son, uh, now the current uh, son of King Abdulaziz is the, is the king. And at the time, the Saudis were poor. And in fact, the Americans bailed them out during, the Saudi royal family bailed them out during World War II with Lend-Lease money. Now, of course, they're fabulously wealthy, uh, so wealthy that they've become objects of scorn. For the, It's not proper in, in, in Islamic world to be so conspicuously wealthy. Not only are they incredibly wealthy, but seen as corrupt corrupt not only from their wealth, but because of their association with the godless Americans. And so our relationship with the Saudi royal family has come back to haunt us in ways uh, th that, that reverberate today with 9-11 and with the, with, to buy off, to buy off this, this, this undercurrent of resentment and complaints and, and, uh, and hostility to the royal family, they've poured, they have poured billions of dollars into extremist jihadist religious foundations around the world, which in turn has gone into the coffers of anti-American extremist movements. So that's one way in which our response has, has turned out bad. I don't have time to, to go down the road and explain each and every one of these instances. The, ne the next worst plan was to use the British as our uh, protectors. And that led to the decision in 1953 to cooperate with the British, our allies, in overthrowing Prime Minister Mosaddegh and installing the Shah in Iran and then beefing up his military and his secret police, the Savak, that looked like a good idea during the Vietnam War when the British pulled out and we needed a surrogate in the area. But in his megalomania and his fear of dissent, the Shah rounded up not only the communists, we didn't worry about that so much, and the socialists and the labor unions and the other dissidents. Then he rounded up all the Shiite clergy and threw them in jail and had them tortured and murdered and whatever 
So when he was finally overthrown, the generation that came to power and now rule in Iran view the United States as the enemy of Iran, and they bear deep hatred and resentment of us because they see us as the, 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 pro, the essential prop to put the shot in power and responsible for the torture and murder of their associates during the, uh, by Savak, made in USA. So it's not surprising that the Iranian leadership today bears us such deep hatred. But that revolution then led to the Carter Doctrine of 1980 because we couldn't rely on the British, we couldn't rely on the Shah, we now had to use military force ourselves to protect the flow of oil. And this then led when Saddam Hussein, who we befriended during the Iran-Iraq war because we liked the idea of Saddam Hussein fighting the Iranians. And when the Iranians turned the tide in 1982, we sent Donald Rumsfeld to Baghdad to embrace Saddam Hussein and provide him with military equipment and intellig military intelligence, not military equipment, military intelligence and loans so as to assist the Iraqis to turn the Iranians back. And I think you can't understand what seemed like an insane idea to invade Kuwait on August 2nd, 1990, without understanding the history in which he had been befriended by the United States as an ally. He must have thought, I believe, he must have thought that he could get away with this. But he didn't realize the commitment we had to the Saudi royal family and the Carter Doctrine, because when President Bush I met with his advisors at Camp David on August 3rd and 4th, 1990, they saw this as a threat to Saudi Arabia, that is the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, and they said it had to be repulsed. And when President Bush went on national television on August 8th, 1990, some of you may remember that speech, he didn't talk about WMD or bringing democracy to the Middle East or human rights in the Middle East, he talked about oil and the protection of Saudi Arabian oil, which he said was essential to the national security of the United States of America, and therefore I am sending an army to Saudi Arabia to protect the kingdom and use force if necessary in accordance, he didn't say the Carter Doctrine, but he used that language. That led to Operation Desert Storm, and as you know, the decision not to invade Baghdad, but to surround Iraq with a quarantine. The intent first of President Bush uh, the first to bring down Saddam Hussein through economic pressure to stir a revolt, to bring a regime change through economic pressure, a policy that was then followed by his successor, Bill Clinton. As we know, this strategy failed because instead of bringing down Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein used this. He exploited it. He used it as propaganda against the godless Americans who were creating, who were, who were forcing babies to die in hospitals. They didn't have medicine and from starvation. Meanwhile, skimming off the profits from the oil for food program to build up his military. So not surprisingly, George Bush, current president, determined that the sanctions plan was failing, couldn't decide what to do, tighter sanctions, as we heard, perhaps, but that didn't seem to be working, as David explained. What choices did he have? He was still debating this on 9-11, uh, and then, of course, decided to invade. A lot of discussion and debate in this country. For the rest of our lives, there'll be a debate about what caused that invasion. As far as I'm concerned, it was a continuation of the first Gulf War, which stalled on February 1st, 1991, with a decision 
to, to rely on non-military means to bring down Saddam Hussein. And when those failed, it was a continuation of that earlier war prompted by the Carter Doctrine, which was very explicit. We cannot allow a threat to arise which would interfere with the safe flow of petroleum from the Persian Gulf. And I think that's the way historians will see it. So one after the other, the decisions of American policymakers, Democrats and Republicans alike, have led to the use of military force to protect the flow of oil or to form alliances, military alliances with the po oil potentates, the petrostates that we rely on. You would think, after all this time, that our leaders, in their wisdom, would see the folly of this strategy. But no, instead of retreating from this approach, we are getting in deeper. And again, this is not, a, not just the Republican administration now in office. It began with Bill Clinton. We heard a reference earlier to Haidar Aliyev, the potentate dynasty, the, the uh, Aliyev dynasty, it's now his son who rules in his place, of Azerbaijan. When, when, when Aliyev visited Washington in 1997, President Clinton announced that the oil from the Caspian Sea is a national security interest of the United States, just as Carter had said the oil from the Persian Gulf is a national security interest of the United States. And Clinton got personally involved in ensuring that that oil would come to the US. And he led the effort to form military alliances with Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Georgia, and set the foundation for ever deepening US military involvement in that region. President Bush has since built on that foundation, but it was established by Clinton, and it was explicitly around the purpose of gaining access to the Caspian Sea's oil, and it was militarized from the very beginning. What President Bush has contributed to this uh, strategy, what I, which I call the globalization of the, of the Carter Doctrine, and by the way, every other presidential doctrine from, from the Cold War, you, you, would, you would say is an artifact of history, the Nixon Doctrine, the Eisenhower Doctrine, the Truman Doctrine, all of these are past. The Carter Doctrine is 100% in effect today. It was the basis for the formation of the Central U.S. Central Command, which now is fighting wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and is possibly gearing up for a war in Iran. So the Carter Doctrine is with us today. It's just being globalized. And the most recent expression of the globalized Carter Doctrine is to move into Africa with the announcement on February 7th of the creation of the African Command, AFRICOM. The last time anybody created the Pentagon, the last time a president created a new regional command was President Carter on January 23rd, 1980, when he announced the Carter Doctrine speech and created the Central Command for protecting the oil of the Persian Gulf and that immediate region. Now President Bush, the first new regional command is creating the African Command. And yes, he says the primary purpose is concern about terrorism in Africa, but when you look closely at what the worry is, the worry is that the terrorists so-called, and then you have to look closely what they mean by terrorists, because it often might mean hyperactive ethnic soldiers or tribes people in the Niger Delta region of southern Nigeria who are revolting against the exploitation of their people by the oil companies and ma mainly the government that has done so much terrible environmental damage to their land and given them nothing in return. So anti-terrorism in the 
African context often means protecting pipelines and oil facilities against sabotage, against terrorists, militias, saboteurs, insurgents, same in the Caspian Sea area. So we have a globalized Carter Doctrine, which is now our response to the, to the, to the fact that we are becoming dependent for our very way of life on a substance that can only be obtained from countries that are dangerous and create all these risks. Let me say a few more things before I finish. This is the, the direction we're headed in. I want to say three more things about it. One, it is insane. It is self-destructive. You cannot protect oil with soldiers. All you do is risk their lives. Because to the people of the areas where our soldiers are being sent, remember these are all areas of the world. I'm talking Africa. I'm talking the Middle East. I'm talking the former Soviet empire. These are former colonial territories, some of them very recently colonial territories. They see American troops coming in to protect oil companies, which they often associate with the imperialist governments of the past. Now, you could say, but we're Americans. We're not imperialists. We're for democracy. But they'll say, you look like an imperialist, you walk like an imperialist, you smell like an imperialist, you are an imperialist. I'm not saying that that's the case. Please don't misunderstand me. We could have a political science debate about it. That is the way we are going to be perceived by people in these areas who already bear resentments against us, which is the case in all of these countries. We are, this is a natural recruiting poster for Al-Qaeda and all of the other spin-offs. So the more we rely on American troops to protect oil facilities and oil company installations in these areas of hostility, the more terrorism, insurgency, and violence we will invite, have invited, are going to see. So relying on the military to protect the flow of oil is a suicidal, dangerous, futile effort. Second thing I want to say about it is, it is exceedingly expensive. It is canceling out any money we might conceivably have to make the changes we have to make to develop the alternatives that we need. I estimate the cost of enforcement of the Carter Doctrine at $100 billion a year cost of the war in Iraq, and we could argue about this, please challenge me. You know, it's another $100 billion or so a year. Over the course of this decade, we're talking a trillion dollars on the military protection of energy. That's a trillion dollars down the toilet that will not result in a single improvement in the development of energy alternatives. So we're one trillion dollars behind in the development of all these alternatives that we heard about, that we need. And if we go down this path another decade, we will be even more behind. And I don't believe that we're going to find another source of money, one trillion dollars. One trillion dollars is approximately what it's going to cost to create the the uh, energy alternatives on a scale large enough to make up for a, even a small dent in our oil consumption. And my last point is morality. And I'll just speak for myself. The notion of using American soldiers to protect the flow of oil so people can, can pour this into obscenely wasteful vehicles, I find immoral. I don't know what you think, but thank you for listening to me.